Hey guys, welcome again to the third edition of Dr. John Pauli's uh, series with us. I have coupleofern.org, our uh, wonderful chapters website right now. I'm going to click on events, which is right over here, and kind of go through our announcements really, really briefly. Tonight we have Dr. Pipoli, uh, and this is his third rendition, like I said, of the modern perspective on vascular plants. He'll be discussing in a grade primitive mon uh, monocots and magnolia relatives. So these are some very early lineages of our plant uh, diversification. Uh, this Saturday, in case you happen to be in our region, please come and say hello. We're at the Stanford Garden Club. Uh, August 20th, 8.30 a.m. until 1.30 p.m. It's gonna be a large native plant sale. Uh, as some of you know, our vision here at Couple of Fern in Seminole and West Volusia counties is to increase native plant representation by 20%, which is an ambitious goal, 20% over the next 10 years within our region. So no matter where we are, your backyard, uh, conservation area, the roadside median, everywhere, increased native plant representation. And we're tracking those metrics. So this is year one, actually year zero. So we're taking metrics right now to create baseline information. Um, but this plant sale, everything that we sell will contribute towards that vision and provide metrics for us. Uh, the following Monday, which is this upcoming Monday on the 22nd is our renowned garden party. What's a garden party for us? We do a potluck, people bring food to munch on. We have general announcements about chapter happenings, and then we delve right into presentation. So gardeners come up, they speak for about 20 minutes. They'll talk about their personal experience with native plants, growing, pros and cons, tips and tricks. That way, when you come to a future plant sale with us, you know exactly what you're buying into. That is August 22nd, and it'll be from 6 30 until 8 30 p.m. at Seminole Isis Auditorium. Uh, our wonderful Dr. John Pipoli will be with us again on August 29th and will be his, his final presentation with us covering angiosperms, dicots, and the new legume classification. So a big, big thank you to Dr. Pipoli. Um, he has been, in my personal opinion, an amazing teacher. Uh, everything that he puts out, he puts out with great energy, enthusiasm, and he makes sure that you remember some of the things that could probably be a snooze fest for others in a very informative and fun way. So uh, again, a, a big thank you to Dr. Pipoli for that. Um, we are having a special campaign right now, guys. And if you head over to coupleofern.org and you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see a nifty campaign called I Like It Derby. It's our new t-shirt campaign and it supports Couple of Ferns. So there it is, I Like It Derby. And it's got little native plants in there. It's got our namesake ferns, some wildflowers. Please go over to coupleofern.org, uh, click on the link and you can get more information about the I Like It Derby campaign. Florida Native Plant Society, our parent chapter, go to fnps.org. You can click on the join button, which is right up top, click membership info. The uh, membership page looks like this, and you can select a chapter that is local to you. For us here in Seminole and West Volusia, it is Couple of Ferns. If you happen to be in Dr. Pipoli's region, it is Broward County. Or if you happen to be our sponsored chapter, uh, which is Citrus, they have Citrus chapter here as well. What are our, oh, oh, there's tons of others. There we go. Like there is Comdina, there's Broward, Eugenia, Hernando, Heartland. Make sure that you are picking a chapter that is closest to you so you can make a local difference. There are 33 chapters across the state, and I have the rare pleasure of informing our viewership that we have just surpassed the 5,000 membership mark. So we are growing pretty fast. FNPS.org. Couple of firm, Native Plant Society. Where to find Dr. Pipoli's 
past videos, how to revisit them. They're always jam packed with informative little niche, you know, tidbits, nuances. Perhaps you can utilize this in a future essay or paper of yours. How to revisit Dr. Pipoli's informative tidbits. Go to uh, youtube.com slash couple fern. They have been forever preserved here in our channel. Simply cool. click subscribe in the top right corner to support us for free. Yes, John, you're going to say something. No, I was, I was going to ask you if there's one in Orange County too. Is there yes. A yes, tar okay. flower chapter. Tar flower chapter. Yes. In all those areas, you guys are building so fast. If, if you can make friends with the, uh, the code enforcement people, the landscape code enforcement people. We and already then, are. Then, then you yeah. can you know, plant native plants and do it right the first time. You know? Yep. Yep. Actually, right now, uh, our uh, Board of County Commissioners here in Seminole, they're going to meet and they're going to discuss how to adopt and implement the Florida Friendly Landscape Program. So it's a little bit different from uh, the Native Plant Society's message. The, uh, the uh, Florida Friendly Landscape Program also includes some exotics that are uh, not invasive. They may be non-native, but they are not invasive. Um, so we're going to try to see how we can diversify that palette by including more native plants. Oak trees are well represented in our landscape. I'm sure many of you that are in Central Florida can attest to that. But how about diversifying that? How about adding some persimmon in there? That is the laurel host for the Luna Moth. How about adding some Sweet gum in there. That is the larval host for the Io moth. Those are some very, very beautiful moths out there. Butterflies are very well respected and admired, but some of our moths out there are equally, if not more beautiful. But you can find more information about Dr. Pipoli, youtube.com slash couple of firm. Please subscribe. I'll put that into the uh, message in the chat box soon as well. Uh, Dr. Pipoli, you want to touch on Broward uh, Park and just give a shout out to your uh, profession here as well? Oh, yeah, sure. We have in Broward County, we have um, 46 programs among our um, five nature centers. We have 22 natural areas, um, 17 regional parks. About a third of them have a natural area also within the regional park, aside from, you know, cricket fields or model airplane fields or <laughs> we also have uh, a uh, a drone co um, competition course um, all kinds of stuff it's re it's really good and there are also eight neighborhood parks in some of the uh, disadvantaged areas of the county um, yeah so if you go to uh, Broward County parks Broward Broward.org forward slash park. parks then and you look for things to do and look in STEAM, S-T-E-A-M, yeah. science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And at the and as you go through that web page at the bottom in blue, it'll say um, programs in the schools. You click on it, and they're all there with all of the learning standards that they cover. So a teacher yeah. only has to hit Control F, put the number she wants or he wants, and boom, it'll pop right up. It's very nice. This Broward area STEM ecosystem is a thing by the school district. It's a little more, um, it has a lot to do with coding and computers more than, than a lot of natural history and ecology and whatnot. But um, mm -hmm. with two interns, I've just finished a science, a series of PowerPoints that go into really fun web pages with all kinds of games for kids to test their knowledge. Their science review for fourth and fifth grade. The all of the educational psychologists tell us that if a student has not at least somewhat caught up by by the end of fifth grade, the likelihood that that kid will not will graduate from high school is about nil. So we have to get them in the fourth and fifth grade, and kids are doing worse rather than better. So these reviews are meant to hit on the main points that the, that the teachers give them in the class, but with some of that material that they've seen, but a lot of it that they haven't, that supports it. And mm -hmm. then the Spanish ones, it's not just uh, 
direct translation of the text from the English one, but it's it's in Spanish from start to finish and with links to Spanish websites. So it's really amazing. I had uh, a presidential management, a presidential um, scholar from Nova Southeastern University write the bulk of the English ones, 16 of them. And then I had a, uh, a fellow uh, undergraduate uh, pre-law from the University of Florida that wrote the Spanish. Mm -hmm. native speaker a, a, a dual national mexican and um american so um you guys are doing amazing work you guys it, are doing amazing work but this thing is going to be free at this broward area stem ecosystem and also at the league of environmental educators in florida sure. leef-fl.org -E mm -hmm. that means free for teachers free for students free for parents free for administrators free for anyone who works at a small little um, uh, nature reserve or ecotourism place. Remember, mm -hmm. you can do to help fourth and fifth graders will have a tremendous impact on the next generation. They really are crying for help. And I think it behooves all of us to spend a little time rescuing a few fourth and fifth graders. It'll Amazing. Pay. Amazing. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pipoli. Just for being the person you are, uh, folks, <laughs> I have I have put both of Dr. Pipel. He just touched on Broward Park, the stem leg of it, and Leaf, Florida. I put both of them in the uh, main screen for you guys to explore. The resources that he is referring to will be available in just a few weeks. So please check back, maybe in three or four weeks, right. and they should be available in a new send, tab here I'll on Leaf. I'll send you a note that you can post to all your members to say, "Come and get Absolutely. it." Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. More information on this wonderful organization called leaf-florida.org. They partner up with renowned uh, educational stations like, such as the Archibald Biological Station as well. Oh yeah, They have great partnerships with people out there, uh, but also with wonderful people like John. So Thanks. please, uh, please explore that feature. And I just want to give it a little bit of a shout out to the Florida Master Naturalist Program. Oh, absolutely. Dr. Pipoli is a uh, lead instructor down in Broward County. So in case you guys are new to the Master Naturalist aspect, what is the Master Naturalist program? I'm sure some of you have heard about the Florida Master Gardener program. So it is a, I would say a cousin to that program. It's still part yeah. of the University of Florida's uh, large educational system. They call it Master Naturalist. Simply Google Florida Master Naturalist, and you should land on a page that looks something like this. Currently, Broward, that John served, is uh, offering the habitat evaluation, but Broward and uh, John's team happens to be very special. They offer pretty much every single course that you will see here. Uh, as they become available, they will pop up and say Broward County, and you can click and explore more. Yes, John. Yeah, well, wildlife monitoring will be offered at, at the in the middle the middle of October. Um, habitat evaluations in the beginning of October. So um, we'll, we'll look forward to, to seeing everybody. Wild uh, habitat evaluation is really um, inventory and monitoring of vegetation, and, and with it, I give a special lecture on. On, on perceiving forest health through an understanding of uh, our tr tree architectural modeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody else does that. If you can look and see what the trees are doing, you know the health of the forest instantly. So, so that it's a lot of fun. And it'll be at Miramar Pineland, which has been a regional park for a while, but it is now our brand new there, in fact, there hasn't even been anybody given a lecture in the building yet. Uh, uh, be the new nature center. In fact, right now, for those of you that are qualified, um, they are advertising for a naturalist to take to take the lead there. Really, Pineland? Yes. Yeah, so we are looking so for you. So you'll have three teams, or you will have two teams and one additional lead as part of one of those two. Oh teams. no, they won't. That that'll be a naturalist that re, a, a park naturalist as opposed to a. Florida Master Naturalist Instructor. The Florida Master Naturalist Program is by, from the University of Florida, but through the School of 
um, wildlife ecology and conservation, completely separate from the ag folks. Amazing. So, um, that that's from Marty Mann and, and all all his mm -hmm. uh, associates. The, what I'm talking about is the park system has naturalists in nature centers. Uh, they go out and do programs, uh, educational programs, also in the natural areas. In the so nature center and natural areas. I'm a part. Of, I'm I belong to the environmental management section where we have natural resource managers. So, so they're specialists in different things. Like there's one person that's a uh, mm -hmm. inventory and monitoring of all wild flora and fauna. Another person does strictly restoration of um, aquatic habitats and marine. The other person does strict re restoration of terrestrial things. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they work together. They're very active with e-sysma, which is across the state where mm -hmm. we work all the invasive species in the Everglades and all those repercussions. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, PJ, PJ uh, one of our uh, wonderful viewers, she's actually been viewing uh, our live streams from years on back and coincidentally also happens to be a, a previous student of yours. Uh, she wanted to share some insight. She can't get anybody to answer calls about the Master Naturalist Program and classes so if you page. can help her with a live person on the line yeah, sure. that could be beneficial no problem pj um 954 <laughs> i don't care that's what my county cell is for, for it's also for receiving calls about people who are on life support me have after having been poisoned by plants <laughs> <laughs> she is she is a stellar um, master gardener, just like Margot Hummer, who also comes to these. That is mm -hmm. just just um, what do I want to say? She's in the like ionosphere as opposed to the red stratosphere, <laughs> as far as uh, master gardeners are concerned. All of those people were the master gardeners that started community gardens in Broward County and got people to think about greening up their neighborhood. That they don't realize the impact they've had in their local communities. It's just phenomenal. You guys are you guys are either un, unappreciated or unacknowledged, one or the other, yeah. and uh, or both. And guys, please, you know, like our viewership, I really want to stress this: just because you don't have a PhD behind your name, doesn't mean that you didn't make your mark in this world or made a mark, you know, for the health of the planet. Everybody's place, everybody's time, everybody's intention is what this world needs to make or to turn the tide around. There's a lot counting on this becoming a global movement, this becoming a, um, a cultural norm. Yeah. And uh, I know with people like John at the helm, uh, we're in good hands because he's so Excellent. passionate and he's well, such an excellent teacher. Well, Mar I'm very lucky to have students that are so talented. Margo was the, the founder of um, business IT at the University of Miami. So, And that's when the guys didn't let the ladies do anything. So she had the guts to, to charge through the, the middle of the line, you know, and run for the touchdown. Yeah. So PJ is ask actually asking for the phone number again. So okay. if you can, go ahead and uh-huh. 914-0016. 0016. There. I just put it on the screen, guys. Master Naturalist, if you have any questions, uh, Broward Parks can help you as well, especially for people that are wanting <laughs> to uh, pursue the Broward aspect. I put it up, didn't you see? <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, I for a good time call. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. So, well, very good. Uh, let's uh, dig right into John's presentation without further ado. John, if you'd like to share All the right. screen. I'm going to share here. Share. Where do I go to slides, right? Yes. Slides. You have no slides. Add file from your computer. Uh, upload file. Where I go? Okay, desktop. Give me one sec here. No worries. Take your time.
I think I got it. Let's see if it comes. It's still uploading. This isn't as bad as the one that was um, spore plants. That was huge. Oh, yeah. It's a little, little more toned down. <laughs> I personally enjoyed it. And, oh, and oh, you know me. Well, you know, I really should have made the monocots a separate one because I actually, when I teach it, I, I teach it in three Boy. lectures. But I didn't think anybody could survive that. Well, it, it's interesting because it's the more you delve into it, the more, you know, the more you read about plants, it, they reveal themselves to you. Oh, yeah. And you really understand and appreciate the background and the evolutionary yeah. history. And uh, How do I get this it thing? helps. I got you. It helps okay. click everything together. Cool. Okay. So. All right. I'll leave you to it, John. Okay. And, so I can uh, go to the top and make it a full screen or what? Yes. Or, oh, but then I won't see the chats, right? I won't be able to answer any questions. Are you going to do that? If, I got you. And if and if you can see the screen uh, where your presentation oh, is, I will. All right. There we go. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Have fun. Yeah, okay. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Um, I promise to keep things moving. Um, primitive angiosperms or the ANA grade, that refers to plants that have very primitive characteristics in Florida, the only ones we really have are the members of the um, water lilies, the true water lilies. Uh, and then the magnolia group, for years they were considered dicots, but they were dicots with either numerous floral parts or floral parts in threes. And now we know that their wood is different and their pollen is different and a whole lot of other things are different. And then, of course, the monocots we all know about, you know, parts in threes, mostly parallel veins connected only by commensurate veins, etc. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through it all tonight. Don't worry. This is a reminder of what we've been talking about. Um, we, talk, we talked about all these uh, spore bearing plants. Then we gave an overview of the seed plants, which are all these things. Now we're in the flowering plants and we're going to start to talk about the first basic group. This slide you've seen three times already, but tonight we're going to talk about the primitive ones. So either they have no perianth means calyx and corolla or sepals and petals, if you want to call it that, but they have numerous parts and, and most of these things that look like petals will integrate with stamens. So there'll be things that look like real stamens and things that look like funky petals. Um, they have huge rhizomes. They have air canals and they have this weird mucilage that's only found in this group. There's no vascular cambium whatsoever. So it has scattered vessels without the stem or in one ring. But um, it, it, it's very, very primitively arranged. Then you have all these uh, magnolia relatives. You either have numerous tepals. That means you can't tell the petals from the sepals. Or they're in threes like the Lauraceae and the Anonaceae, for example. Um, bundles of vessels in small groups, not like dicots have. They have ethereal oil cells, um, cotyledons two, three, or four, unusual pollen, not three furrows or pores. They have some pollen that, you know, looks like, a, almost looks like a frustule from a diatom, to tell you the truth. Then you have monocots with perianths and threes, vascular bundles throughout the stem. That's, by the way, people think they're going to hurt a palm and go out and cut it halfway across. I have one in my backyard now for uh, 15 years that's halfway cut through, and in all the hurricanes and storms, it doesn't fall because the, the whole stem is nothing but huge bundles and, um, and what are called uh, phloem fibers that are really strong. So um, the, all those plants you see listed here, orchids, palms, gingers, grasses, sedges, rushes, are uh, among the things that are, are that. And then dicots, perianths in four or five, vascular bundles forming a cambium. That's why with dicots, you can figure out how I can move this black thing here. I can't see. Um, uh, you can girdle the outside of the stem. You know, the stem's here and you go boop, like that, and you can kill it. All right, so next. Okay, this is where we have this A and A group of primitive things. So these groups of plants here, these are the water lilies. This Australbailey is a thing from the South Pacific. 
And Ambera Lacey is a thing from New Caledonia only. And um, they just have these indefinite random parts. So they're pretty disorganized. And in general, they're pollinated by different kinds of beetles that kind of just bang around and kind of accidentally pollinate them. So as you look at this, you'll see that uh, as we go up this uh, diagram here, which is called a cladogram or a genealogical tree, if you want to call it. When I was in Texas at the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, I was not allowed to use the word evolution in any public talk by order of the CEO. So I had to talk about genealogies of plants. Couldn't mention evolution for any reason. So um, as we look at this, everything above this line has this pollen that has little um, columns, you know, kind of like the, uh, uh, the columns that you learn in ancient Greece that have the funny tops on the top of them, the Corinthian columns and the Ionic columns and all that, that everything above this can have inferior oils, doesn't necessarily have to, but it can. Plicate carpels. So what that means is if you have a leaf and the leaf has spores on one side, right? Like the like the fern leaves. So supposedly when when they the ancient flowers, this disorganized group like Amberolaceae and Nymphiales, you have this thing where the ovules are on a margin and they come together and this is called a carpel and all it is is a sporophyll a leaf thing that has ovules on one side it's going to come together in an ovary and there'll be a sticky thing on the top either a stalk a style with a sticky thing a stigma or a stigma right here either one so that, that's sort of how that works then we have all the magnolias. These are all the people that have this chemistry that they're talking about. Um, all the monocats have all these characteristics, and you see they're very well defined. Then you have this weird group that's neither monocot nor dicot that they don't really know quite what to do with. Ceratophyllaceae, it's a little group of aquatic plants. Um, they, they lose the ethereal oils up here. But all of the dicots either have triculpate pollen, which means they have three furrows, or uh, triporate pollen, which means there's three holes, or triculporate, which means there's three furrows with a hole in the middle. So we'll, we'll see that as we go on, which is sort of a preview. And this is the same thing we were talking about from the other one. I just made it in a different way. There's different ways to make the same kind of a phylogenetic tree or genealogical tree. And this is the one for all of the flowering plants. Same thing, they just call them primitive angiosperms instead of A and A grade. All right, plant families, A and A grade, here we are. Look at the pollen, it's weird, it's like a little boat. Um, this is our friend Nufara Vena which is um, a uh, water lily. The water lilies have this very strange stem. There aren't really super well-defined bundles. We don't see well-defined leaf traces that come in that we would normally expect. Um, it has air canals. Um, the hairs in here produce this weird mucilaginous slime. So, so that way nobody eats that stuff, no critter. Um, and the other things are not all that, uh, you know, unique or anything. Teeples, four to six. Petals lacking or eight to numerous. So they, they can have all kinds of different things. Nufar is the one that has the least number of, of teeples. Now, these are sort of sepals, but they're yellow. So they're kind of like petals too. So we just call them teeples to, to you know, make matters easier. This is the progression of stamens. So the thing on the left here, it looks like a petal that's clear. Then there's a petal that's clear that has a little area that makes some pollen grains. And by the way, these pollen grains are empty. They don't have any nuclei in them. So the plant is sort of shooting blanks, if you know what I mean. Then as you get over here, farther and farther to the right, you finally arrive at the only functional stamen in this whole group. And that's part of what defines this group. 
okay? Um, numerous uh, carpals. Carpals are the things that we talked about, these guys. Mm -hmm. um, the seeds are operculate. That means when the seeds open to germinate, a little cap opens, goes boop. That's really weird. The, no other flowering plant does that. Okay. Now we go to the basal magnolias. This is a sugar apple up here on the right. This is Aristolochia. That's the Dutchman's pipe. That's the, and those, of course, are really uh, useful for the butterflies. By the way, one of the biggest problems we have here is butterfly fanatics that plant non-native Aristolochias that are very aggressive. So you got to really try to tell people not to do that. It's, it's better to do other sorts of things. Okay. And then you also have to be very responsible and conscientious with your neighbors. If your neighbors are growing citrus, please, even though the plant hosts a whole bunch of butterflies, um, wild lime, don't plant it if you have any citrus around for your neighbors because you will kill all of them. Because all of um, the... Um, what is it? Lakeview jasmine, which is a, 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 shr a shrub that's used as a hedge, and uh, wild lime, um, they, are, they all carry uh, one lung bing, um, yellowing, and um, cit no, citrus greening, excuse me, citrus greening. And uh, they'll, they'll kill all the, um, the citrus in the neighborhood. So sometimes you have to take a step back and, and offer other alternatives so that you don't um, become a purist that kills the rest of the neighborhood because you're not going to win. All righty. So when we, when we look at these primitive magnolias, we see that the wood doesn't have, you know, chains of vessels. It's got just these very scattered ones and it's got a lot of this, these little cells here and they're usually um, full of different kinds of things. This is a cross section. This is a tangential section. And this is a radial section. So for those of you who might not be totally familiar with this, a radial section is through the middle of this. A tangential section is through the edge. And a cross section is this way. Okay. All right. Let me see if I can see this thing again. Great. That was beautiful. Thank you. If that was you that did that. All right. Magnolia AC. Magnolias are fantastic. People are planting them down here and they're really uh, supposed to only go to, to nine. I'd like everyone to think for a minute and to understand that right now, uh, Harding is zone 11. Has, a, has officially become established at Sample Road in, in Broward County, which is really north. I'm working with the National Arboretum who's in charge of that. It'll be another three years before money's authorized to publish another map. You, you folks should basically take, start to plant the plants from the zone south of you. So uh, zone 11 means from now that it's Sample Road, it, Sample Road will never, uh, south of Sample Road, will never have a temperature under 40 ever again. So that means we're going to be fighting iguanas and all the other kinds of things. And what's worse is all the um, uh, Zika, um, chikungunya, dengue, and malaria are all coming up from the Keys. They're in Florida City now. So it's moving up. We just have to, we can't run around in Speedos and bikinis at midnight. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. At least not out, outside where, you know, after after our rain, for example, where you're going to get bit by mosquitoes. We have 11 species of mosquitoes and some of the four that we used to have. So we just have to start thinking about how we live, you know, and be a little careful. Um, South Florida's from Palm Beach County downward is the only place in the U.S. where we have a UV index of 12 from the 1st of April to the 1st of September. 12 means um, 
a light-skinned person like myself burns in less than five minutes. And three of my old roommates are health professionals, two at NIH and, and one at the CDC. And they've all told me that they're seeing um, our generation have skin cancer like no none other in the past. And they're afraid that we might have been preconditioned as kids because we ran around with no shirts on and we got burned, you know, at least three or four times when we were kids. So back to the Magnolia AC. They're really fantastic plants. Um, they have this weird fruit that's a follicle, and you'll see these little areas here where they have all the seeds. So the the flowering, let's see if I have a better picture than the next one. Yeah, you see how the flower is? This is all the um the pistols are down here. These are stigmas that come up. They they get pollinated, and then you have this fruit that opens and the seeds pop out this way. They, these are numerous parts that are spirally arranged. Um, they're tepals because you can't tell petals from sepals. Um, and um, they can they can have uh, new, numerous stamens. They, they're really, they're beautiful. They're really, there's two native species that are really nice. They go all the way down here. Now, for all of you ladies that like Chanel number no. five and all you gentlemen who appreciate that as well, this is um, Ilang Ilang. This is the plant from which it came. You can now grow Elang Elang with no problem in our zone and actually zone 10. I think you guys are still above zone 10, but you'll have to check. Um, the Ananasi are interesting because instead of just having spiral leaves like the other ones, the other, excuse me, magnolia relatives, these guys have disticus leaves. That means each leaf, it should go up the stem, each progressive leaf is 180 degrees from the next. So that means it's like this. That you get a plane effect and you get and you get each leaf 180 degrees from the next. So the branches that grow parallel to the ground are called plagiotropic branches. What does that mean? They have a, a leaf arrangement that allows maximum photosynthetic activity during the day. That means they're really good at growing up fast. So as you go around the world, you'll find that these are the plants that are in forced margins. So that means if you're in an area that has too much sun, an ananasi will do okay. It really will. Okay. Um, here is the pond apple, which is uh, very common in subtropical areas of Florida. And it you can see you have one, two, three, one, two, three. Two worlds of three. Okay. So this is um, this is the first cousin to the guanabana, uh, which is, of course, a very common fruit grown in great quantities in Puerto Rico. Ananasi also have uh, this ruminate endosperm. That just means it has all these these invaginations here in the. Um, the, the tissue on the inside of the seed that feeds the seed as it germinates and grows. Here you see all these stamens, and here you see these pistils sticking up. Okay, so you have three sepals and six petals. Um, and there's a there's an actual disc or ball that the things are on. See how this is elevated here? It's got this little thing. All right. So Next to it is the Lawraceae, only the Lawraceae. The Ananaceae smell is characteristic, but it's not what you call real attractive. The Bay family, the Lawraceae, uh, does have one parasite, which is right out there, the love vine. You can always tell a love vine from a daughter because this is going to have uh, what looks like an inferior ovary. Okay, it's going to have three little sepals around it. But a daughter is a morning glory, so it's going to have four. Never make a mistake with that. Now, everything but Cassitha, this parasite, uh, gets laurel wilt, and it's really unfortunate. There's a beetle that comes in that uh, bores into the trunk, and uh, it has a fungus on its mandibles, and it goes right up to the shoot apex of the tree and it kills it so we can no longer uh export any um, avocados from florida 
So avocados are off the list. Right now, I think the, the product that people are most counting on in the South is um, uh, jackfruit. It, now that there's a miniature jackfruit, that's probably not more than uh, 14 inches in diameter, that's being picked and that's being sold. And wholesale, they're going for a little under $2 a piece, which is just amazing. Um, but the demand is really high. Because um, if you think about the other ones, by the time one end is ripe, the other end's already rotten. So that's a problem. Okay. Um, look at these. You now, when I told you that they have weird stamens in this group, and if not, they have these little appendages and things, there's, there they are. Six tipples. Okay, there's in two worlds here. Stamens are three to 12. They have these flaps. The anther, the stamens open by, the anthers open by flaps. Um, the fruit also has a little weird cupule at the bottom. You always recognize that. So um, this is our uh, per Persia barbonia. This is uh, our uh, avocado flower. And you know you have A and B flowers in the same plant. You have to. They'll only they'll only cross an A will only cross with a B. Okay. Canalaceae, the wild cinnamon family. That's a it's a very weird family. Um, these are lovely trees in the backyard. I don't know if they go all the way up to where you folks are. They may not, but they are really, really nice. And they have uh instead of having nice ve formed vessels, they have these tracheids that have plates on them. So if you can imagine a, a piece of paper and you put it close at the bottom and at the top, and at the top you provide like a sewer grate instead of um, vessels, which are sort of like wide milkshake straws, one put in the other all the way up to put the xylem right up fast. Um, these are very, they clumsily let, you know, pull the water up. And you'll notice that none of the magnolia species get very big. I think the biggest magnolia C type thing maybe are the cinnamons and they grow in um, uh, mid in, uh, central Asia and they get to about 120 feet tall, which is just minuscule in the old world. You know, the, the forest in Southeast and middle Asia is 75 meters is what the canopy is at. So that's 200 some odd feet. The emergence are like 80 meters. So 120 foot of tree has nothing. It's just understory. So, and that's because they're very inefficient bringing water up the stem. I mean, even though their bark is fantastic, they have all kinds of good things. All right. Here's the flowers of Canalaceae. They're very cool. Um, five to 12 petals, but three sepals. See? And, and, the, and the stamens are in sets of threes. So this is this is clearly and with the they have dots on the leaves and they they, they smell very much like Laurace, only a little different. They're they're really neat. Now in the next group next to them are the pipers. The black pepper we use actually comes from a vine and it's from Southeast Asia. In the New World, however, there are thousands of piper species that are very useful to local people for all kinds of different things. There is no pepper that's grown. But the, if, they, if you crush the leaves, they have some alkaloids that are really excellent at numbing the stylets of the um, mosquitoes. So they're effective mosquito repellent. If the mosquito goes to bite you, it gets this, the whole end of its um, uh, mouth parts are all numb. So it doesn't know whether it's had any blood from you or not. And it flies away without normally without hurting you. So it's absolutely fantastic. The problem, though, is when these are moved to another place where there's no predator or nothing eats them, like the simple piper, piper aduncum, which is a little shrub from the all up and down the Andes, that was accidentally introduced into Papua New Guinea. And those little shrubs at two meters, a little under seven feet, are trees that are 40 feet tall, and instead of the stems being the width of your index finger, they are like 
I don't know, 12 inches in diameter. Hollow, but 12 inches in diameter. And, and they just take over the sides of mountains. It's really horrible. It's ruining some of the most pristine forests on Earth. Luckily, it's, it's kind of restricted to where there's a lot of trade with people from the outside. And given that only, uh, I think, less than 10% of the New, uh, Papua New Guineans uh, have had contact with people from, from outside the, um, the country. That, that's geographically speaking, not, not raw po population, because the two major cities, Ley and uh, Port Moresby, have uh, lots of people in them. So anyway, that's uh, uh, Piperaceae are very, very important. And the world expert in the Piperaceae is uh, Ricardo Callejas of the Universidad uh, de Antioquia in um, Medellin, Colombia. He's the big guy. Okay, here's Piper auritum. Now there, there's some uh, Mexican species. Now this is, this is the uh, flowering spike of uh, Peperomia. We have a native species of Peperomia. I believe it's Ovalifolia here. Here, oh no, excuse me, Obtusifo. There it is, right there. That's actually got a division in it. Um, and there's another species over here as well. So Piperaceae is a really neat, neat uh, family. Next to it is are the lizard's tails that always grow in really damp, semi-flooded places. And, and they have some differences in how, uh, how many floral parts they have. And a few of the vessels have that, those same plates. And the stems have two concentric rings of vascular system. And that's, that's a very weird thing. Um, here's what the flowers look like up close. Six to eight stamens which is really weird. Uh, three to five carpels in the ovary, uh, bisexual flowers, little one-seated capsules. And here's our Dutch Dutchman's pipe family. This is Aristolochi. I believe this is Grandiflora. This is one of the ones that gets planted in Florida because it's so unusual and it goes very invasive very quickly. Uh, Aristolochia tomentosa is another thing that we don't want to let out of greenhouse growth for sure um this over here is a sarum i think isn't it oh this up here is sarum condensi i thought i had it well something happened um anyway the um these are actually sepals there are no petals in this family six to twelve stamens four to six carpels all right okay now we come to the monocots Parallel veined leaves, embryo with one cotyledon, stems with scattered vascular bundles, and the root system does not come from the hypocopal. It's adventitious. So that means it's, it, it forms from undifferentiated tissue just under the epidermis. So they're all fibrous. You're never getting any tap roots with monocots. And this is the general classification. And you know, I can't see this bottom part here. So... John, I think your mic got muted, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. You're good. It was, it was just 10 seconds ago. Oh, okay. Well, Acorales includes all the orchids and their relatives. Elizabethales are the duck potatoes. Pandanales, those weird plants with great big long prop roots and the fruits on them that hang down that look like medieval maces that people used to break people's bodies open with. Um, pandans are so important in Southeast Asia, in tropical Southeast Asia. They're even more important than palms because they grow so much faster. And they're the screw pines. So they're all twisted and they're very sharp. But, you know, they you can really work with them to weave things, make baskets and hats. and I mean, you name it. They're really, really important. And then for poor people, the pandan fruits, they come apart like fingers and they're boiled and they're a source of starch as if rice and all the other roots they eat aren't enough. And of course, the, the yams are, the, are right there too. The yams, of course, are all vines. Um, and by the way, yams from the New World twine to the left as you look up the stem. Twines from the old world, which are the ones the people eat, 
uh, go to the right. It's, it's the same with all the other votes. So that's how you tell a lot of things. And, and with position of one petal to the next, if the looking up the flower, they overlap to the right, then they're from Eastern Hemisphere. They overlap to the left, they're from the Western. No one knows why. So hopefully this will be something that somebody can look up someday. Here's all the lilies and their relatives, the asparagus and their relatives, palms and their relatives, daisy pogon. That's you know that's like one weird looking thing that kind of looks like a um, dracaena but isn't. Uh, all the grasses and their relatives. You remember grasses feed the world. There are like fourteen really important cereal grains that are in among the grasses, plus the bamboos, which houses um, a quarter of the people on earth. Some part of the house is made from bamboo. Uh, then the gingers and their relatives. Uh, and then all the uh, things that are related to um, the uh, day flowers. So that's sort of the, the story with that. And here's the cladogram, you know. If you don't know the, if you want to make the grade, you have to know the clade. So I just thought I would tell you. Um Here are the grasses here, and the sedges are over here, uh, the gingers, the palms, and then these are all the the uh, asparagus type things. That's the latest thought. This is a repetition of that. Okay, there's one family of monocots that don't necessarily have a lot of parallel veins, except in philodendron and a couple others, and that's the Araceae family. They can be terrestrial, they can be aquatics, they can be epiphytes. They can have clear sap or white sap, but I do want to tell everyone, always assume that an aeroid has calcium oxalate crystals. If your grandkids or your pets bite the leaf, their mouth is going to swell like no tomorrow, and they will have to go to the hospital, and they'll give them some very particular kinds of antihistamines to bring to bring some of the suffering down and they'll put something in their mouth so they can breathe because it'll really jam them up. And of course they cry and then their nose gets jammed and they wipe it off and just make it worse. All right. Now um, they have alternate leaves or spiral, but they also have, excuse me, catafils. These are these weird bracts that protect the vegetated bud. So it's a thing that's on the outside. The other group of plants we know that have cataphils are the cycads. So this is a, a mechanism not to dry out. Um, they have inflorescences that are lateral, never terminal. There's a spathe and a spadix, but we'll look at that even more closely here. Here's the spathe and here's the spadix. This is Anthuria mandriana from the Western Cordillera of Colombia. This is, uh, can't see it, whoop, can't see it, I'll have to go, oh. one sec here, how can I go back, we'll go back, okay, um, this, what is this, I can't see it, can't see it, man, the black thing in the bottom, I Keeps me from seeing it. All right. Well, whatever this one is, a philodendron is very much like that. The pistillate flowers on the bottom and the staminate ones are on the top. And it turns out that most of these that have the sexes separated instead of being bisexual here are not self-compatible. So they have to find an insect that will go from one to the other. Okay. Now, this is the water lettuce. And I know you've never seen the flower. Here is the inflorescence of the water lettuce, and there's an individual flowers. So these are individual little baby flowers here, same as here. So this is an inflorescence, not a flower. So when they talk about four tepals, you're going to be able to see those unless you have a 20 or 30x lens for sure. But they're uh, they're really cool plants, very important. Um, now, <clears throat> big monocots that are important to all of us in Florida on the coasts are several families, like you have paddle glass, star grass, widgeon grass. God, I can't get this. 
I can't see that one. Manatee grass, turtle grass, all of the um, them, a lot of them belong to the hydrocaritaceae um, or the haloragadaceae also. Um, we have these, um, they're marine and freshwater herbs. They have these little funky looking um, uh, leaves. The inflorescence on them is solitary flowers. And these are um, bracts and then the little flowers are in here. Um, Elodea, this is the thing you used to buy for your fish tank. Hydrilla, this is the, the, the hated um, invasive species of ponds all across the uh, state. Here's our paddle grass. There's star grass. They have, there's several other um, halophila, several other um, types of sea grasses. These things are critical for the uh, manatees and for other things that, that come along and eat them. Um, the problem in our intercoastal ways, all the way up the state, are that people with big boats go too fast and they mash up the manatees and they ruin these. People want to dredge all the time, and they, they uproot them and, and leave them with nothing. And we end up with a lot of uh, contaminants that float to the bottom, and things are just really bad. There's not enough oxygen exchange because we don't have plants in there, and it's a problem. It's a real problem. Here's the uh, hydrocaritase, turtle grass. Turtle grass is very important. There's how it is. It has a little rhizome, has this short body. And you know what's interesting is the the manatees only eat up to here. They don't kill the resource. They only eat up to here. So they're they're quite disciplined. They'll go hungry before they go too far down. Rupiaceae, that's another widgeon grass. That's that's another um, monocot that's submerged with the teeny flowers. Here are all the technical things about them, but you just know they have these little groups of flowers here on this very little thin stem. This uh, Simodo Ciesi is uh, uh, the shoal grass. That one, that one occurs in clumps that are thick enough that a group of um, some fish and a group of um, um, sea cows can come in there and, and they'll actually have enough to eat with that. And there's... Um, and the, the little ones really love these ones because they're not as difficult to chew as the paddle grass and the other grasses. They're easily digested. So this is uh, very, very important. All right, here's manatee grass itself. And of course, it's called manatee grass because manatees just go crazy for it. It's sort of like catnip is to cats. They really, really like it. Uh, probably because... Um, they have these clusters of fruits that are just jam-packed with nutrients, you know. They munch on these for a while, and it's it's like giving a two-year-old a candy bar and then give them a Red, red Bull to drink it down with, you know. I really like it. Potomagitanaceae pondweed family. That's a fantastic family. It's all the way across the U.S. A lot of times... There's a, an above water leaf form and a below water leaf form that's much more dissected. It gives more surface area, which is really great in the water because the more surface area it has, the more oxygen exchange happens. So these plants are so important to our environment. People have no idea. Primary productivity in aquatic systems is, is really dependent on plants even more, more than algae, actually. So it's, uh, it's a big deal. There's the inflorescence. The inflorescence normally sticks out of the water because it's pollinated by different kinds of flies and little bees, depending on where you are. Okay. Now we get to all the group of gingers and bananas. So Marin Tacy, the prayer plant family, you know, Calathe and its relative. Canace, those are the, the ones that are from Southeast Asia. They either have yellow flowers or or I think there's a couple ones with uh, blue flowers. They have the largest starch grains on earth. If any of you are teachers and you need to teach about starch grains to a kid, man, you just take a rhizome and you slit it with a, uh, a razor blade carefully, as thin as you can. 
put a drop of iodine on it and you know even look at a 10 10x lens on a piece of glass and they'll see these giant starch grains that look like little footballs they are so cool they're really really nice and here are the gingers and there's lots of gingers costaceae is the group of plants that have the little spiral stems um gingers are separated from cost cost us because they have straight stems and at the base of of where the leaf starts a sheath from the blade there's uh they have what's called a ligule so that's some of the things you see on grasses it's like a little uh beard uh loeaceae is a very weird banana kind of family heliconiaceae is incredible there's a whole book published by the smithsonian on heliconia a lot of this um there are more heliconias in Colombia than there are anywhere else. Um, they're fantastic. They come in erect types where um, the flowers are disticus in one plane. Um, they have other ones that have great big pendant hanging inflorescences with the flowers in one plane. Then they have the ones where the, where the flowers are in three planes. So as you look at it, you can see that they're spiral. So the spiral one is the Cytochorum group. The one that's erect is the Baha'i group. And the other one that's pendant is the beefsteak heliconi group. And they're, uh, they're all pollinated by different things. They support everything from, I think, about 18 different species of hummingbird to, uh, in the evening, sometimes some bats will visit. Not very often. They've been documented in Costa Rica, I think, in one place. And uh, in in the uh, Asian, there are Asian uh, species. I don't know if if they're particularly native there. At least they're growing there anyway. Um, but Heliconia is more or less an, a new world thing. And the Musaceae, the strict bananas, are old world. Now that we're in the DNA age, we have now, um, through fingerprinting, determined that the original banana, the primitive banana, is not from a banana republic and it is not from indochina which a lot of other people thought it is actually from the fly river in papua new guinea which is about three uh 25 down from the northern coast the fly river goes east to west and it has uh, bananas that have seeds about as big as the large marbles so there's not a whole lot to eat there, and they have uh, big, these big seeds that are pretty hard. But that's the hyper-primitive banana, and that's where it's from. So um, these are all over here are all the different uh, characteristics that um, formulate the hypothesis that we use to postulate who came, who came along when and what event triggered uh, diversification. For those of you that don't know what Tixis is, if you think about the way the margins of leaves fold with respect to the midrib and with respect to each other, that's Tixis. The same kind of positional phenomena associated with calices and corollas sepals and petals is called estivation a-e-s-t-i-v-a-t-i-o-n and that same book that um, we showed you last time um, vascular plant systematics will tell you that uh, of all the different kinds of things that are associated with that ad nauseum okay so next this is just to show you how far sedges are from grasses. They're in the, a complete next group, evolutionary group. Now realize that at this V at the bottom, you can spin that 180 degrees so the grasses look like they're next to the other ones. But this other group really separates everything. So it's... um. There are no direct links between these and these, except down at this level. Okay? That's just so you know. The xyrids, of course, are the star grasses. 
Rapatiaceae is a weird group of plant monocots that are on tops of the mountains in the lost world of Venezuela. And they have a, for some unknown reason, they have this um, diterpene in them. So you drop one match or throw a lit cigarette there and goodbye. That happened to us. We we're on top of a mountain and our pilot decided he was going to throw a lit cigarette down on the Rapatia and we had to put the fire out for four hours. It was kind of almost blew up the plane. So we, we were afraid we were going to make an ash of ourselves. Anyway, so now to look at the flowers of these, which of course you can see when you drive down the expressway. Um, John Casey have tepals and there are six tepals and there are six stamens and there's, you have one style in a stigma with three branches. That is so easy and straightforward. No weirdness, just the way it is. It's very nice. The sedges have one bract. And here's the ovary. And it sits in a, they don't show it here. I don't know why. It sits in a, like a little change purse. And then there's three stamens and there are only two, two stigmas. The grasses have glooms, which are outside bracts, not shown here. And then they have a lemma and a palea. Then inside the lemma and the palea, which are also bracts, are what are called lodicules. And they're just these little nubs as if there were three little boogers in there. And those are the, that's the calyx, okay? And then you have the three stamens and you just have two stigmas. All right, now here's what I want everyone to, to learn. So we're going to please repeat after me. Sedges have edges. Rushes are round, also solid. Grasses are hollow all the way to the ground, except that the nodes were there. Full all the way across. So sedges have edges. Rushes are round. Grasses are hollow all the way to the ground. Most grasses are not really round. They're depressed round. So we'll see that in a minute or two there. Here's the juncus. And here's what we were talking about, our six tables, eh? And um, most of them have an inflorescence that comes out of the stem sideways like this. Very easy to see. The leaves are three ranked, so they're in clusters of three. Okay. The inflorescence actually terminates something, and there's a little branch in here that branches off. Very weird for Monica. The flowers are mostly bisexual. When they're unisexual, then they have boy plants and girl plants. All right, these always have rhizomes. Okay. Now, here's another rush. Here's a close up. These are fantastic shots of the tepals and then the developing fruit. Really, really cool. Um, and these are capsules. They'll open up and have a bunch of seeds in there. Here are the sedges. Sedges have edges. Bing, bing. Sometimes the edges are rounded, but they have edges. Down in our neck of the woods, we have Star Rush White, uh, white Top, which is uh, Cyperus... Uh, Pedunculatus, it used to be Rincos, or Cyperus, um, not Cyperus, eh, Rincospera colorata, I'm sorry. It used to be a dichromina years ago. But those three bracts are very prominent. And that particular sedge can be used where it's too wet and you can't keep the lawn growing. And, you know, I see these people throwing all this fertilizer and just ridiculous things to try to get the grass to grow. And I said, why don't you just plant a sedge? What's that? Well, if you'd have, if you'd have spoken to your local master gardener, you would have known, or your native plant society member, because everybody knows that if you plant a sedge where it's too wet, the sedge will be happy and you can mow it with the lawnmower. It just looks like the rough on the golf course. So why not? It's perfectly logical. When I first started as an extension agent, I was there two weeks and this guy came in, and he apparently was well-connected to the mayor. And he wanted this, and he wanted that, and he wanted the other. And I said, what's the essence of your problem? So he showed me the picture of his yard, and I said, 
Yeah, this is all dead here. It looks like it's wet. You should turn your sprinklers off. He said, no, I have I have a, uh, a wet spot. There's some kind of water source under there and nothing's leaking. It's just the way it is. And there's even peat under it. And I said, okay, I'm going to give you the name of the seer, the lady at Sears that has a native plant nursery there. And you're going to ask for a star rush white top. And Donna Torrey, who was actually the leader of all master gardeners in the state of Florida, uh, represented master gardening to the um, National Wildflower Foundation. She provided the man with, I don't know, maybe 20 flats of that. He put it out. Man, the guy had, was perfect. It was wonderful. Super easy planted. Let it grow to like eight, nine inches. Then he cut it at six inches rather than five, you know, not to, to um, expose too much. And he kept it cut maybe five inches or so after a while. Wonderful. No problem. It was good. So that was a nice story. Okay, these are the types of floral diagrams you can find in sedges, which have edges, of course. Okay, so you have these little, there's pistolet flowers, and these are stamina flowers that having a good time there. All righty. Here's some more pictures of, of flowers and inflorescences. Here's a stamina flower. Just stamens and the pistolet parts all withered. And here's a pistolet flower with uh, the stamina parts all withered. So this fruit is an achene. All that, that an achene means it's some part of the um, perianth, either calyx or corolla or something that represents that sticks to the seed and the fruit is like that. Okay. Okay. Next thing. Okay. Now we're going to talk about grass. A rhizome is an underground stem that goes from the root area of a plant over and establishes another plant, and it takes off. A stolen is one that grows on the ground. There you go. They're both stems, anatomically speaking. You have a, you know about nodes and internodes where uh, where the leaves come into the stem. When you have a sheath sheathing um, leaf. You have, there's a node up there. There's a, this is part of the grass right here. We'll soon see what the ligule looks like. Here are clumping bamboos and running bamboos. Please don't plant running bamboos. They just go crazy. And it's very difficult to control. Over half the running bamboos have some sort of, since this is a stem, they have some sort of, um, thorn on them and they can really do some damage to you the leaves are always disticus by the way in in, um, in grasses this is a fantastic microscope shot of a a, a lemma and a palea lemma and a palea excuse me with the stamen and the um stigma there Here's another diagram. Here, here are these lodicules I told you about. Here's the ovary, style, stigma. Those are the anthers and those are the filaments. Okay. And that's it. So, um, this has been a very brief view. I really didn't get into the orchids or any of those things because I just wanted to touch oh, man. principal groups. Otherwise, we could be here for like two <laughs> And I think that you guys, um, toothpicks would wear out. <laughs> well, John, John, I was glued to my screen. I mean, at first, but I might be an outlier. I know that. And uh, busy taking notes. And oh my gosh, like I always think of your presentations as being gold, something that is so worth uh, revisiting because there's really some. Every slide has almost a rabbit hole associated with it. You say something, 
you could go down the rabbit hole, you can explore further. Next slide, the same thing, the next slide, the same thing. And you could really get a crash course on, folks, if you're listening in, I can tell you, and I can personally attest, John Pipoli's slides can encompass probably some of the most voluminous books out there in 40 slides. And if, if 40 slides sounds humongous to you, trust me, if, if a big old botany book is landed in front of you onto your lap, you will say, gosh, I wish I had revisited John Pipoli's slides and taken them one step at a time. Well, this is sort of an executive summary of those groups. So I want yeah. every to go home tonight knowing oh no you're very welcome elizabeth thank you um it's very important to me that everybody knows that there are four groups of flowering plants there are primitive ones there are magnolia relatives there are monocots and there are dicots if anyone tries to tell you that there are only monocots and dicots you say i'm so sorry you're 25 years behind yeah <laughs> All right. And the thing that I never figured out is why some people that teach master gardeners teach that when Dr. Soltis or the Soltai, mm -hmm. Dr. Mm -hmm. M and Doug Soltis at the University of Florida mm -hmm. are are the the counterpart to the Royal Botanical Garden of Kew who make the tree of life for plants. And they're the ones that have been espousing this since 1981. When wow. I was a graduate student at the New York Botanical Garden. Wow. Yeah. That's why he's a national, he's a member of the National Academy of Science. You're elected to that for life. Yeah. And they have a guy that's one of the national treasures. If you count up how much money he's had in grants, it's a quarter of the budget of the National Science Foundation. He has, wow. he's taught something akin to like 50,000 students. His outreach is. It's incredible. And Amazing. so he and his wife are so humble and nice. And mm -hmm. they they try to work with everybody. They interface with agricultural people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right now, what yes, they, they know do. about DNA and times of divergence, they've they've gone to meetings of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN and said, look, you need to worry about these crops. The, the, these bad relatives have all kinds of invasives and they're going to <laughs> I'm telling you, you're going to lose the crop. So, you know, they're, and they don't need to do that. They went out of their our own money. Mm -hmm. So that's what kind of people they are. They really want mm -hmm. to, to help. Well, uh, Doug and Pam Soltis are uh, local names here in Central Florida. And I wish more people knew about them and their, uh, their uh, life body of work. I mean, they've been around for a very, very long time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, very the well. Ones left in that apartment. All the good oh, yeah. people are tired. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. So, folks, I'm going to actually uh, add on a few more uh, pages uh, based on Dr. Pipoli's very, very informative presentation, as usual, tonight. So let's kind of jump right into it. I wanted to bring in some pictures for... Uh, I call it Kasitha. Do you call it Kasitha? Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. It's either one. Kasitha is, okay. is probably. Kasitha. Yeah. So this is what uh, Dr. Pipoli was uh, saying. It was the uh, uh, the perianth segments. They're just yeah. three. Three tepals. Three of them. Yeah. yeah. And see, a daughter has four. Yeah. You... Yeah. So there they are. Uh, three. One, two, three. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And, and then here's a daughter. And a daughter is a convolvulacy. It's a morning glory. Yeah. It's a morning so glory. Down. Down. <laughs> ah, there it is. One, two, there three, four. Oh, five yeah. parts, actually. Yeah, there you five. go. Five. Well, I, I think it's four sepals. I'm not sure, though. Four sepals. Yeah. Fruit. Is there one in yeah. fruit? Yeah, that, that's pretty cool. I mean, I, I just wanted to highlight the difference, you know, the oh, yeah. small details help you figure out which lineage things are, even though there may be some indication of convergent evolution. Yeah, of course. But see, when the, when, when the poor 
person has to go out and do an inventory and they see this thing that looks like daughter all over the place and they say, well, what is it? Is it a love vine or is it daughter? Well, yeah. people, you can't make them. That's why you learn plant families. Don't ever try yeah. to learn individual plants. Because when you learn plant families, like tomorrow, I could go to New call into place. I, I could go to New Guinea and I would know all the plants to family, no doubt. I may not know weird genera, I may be tough yeah. to recognize them, but if I say right. oh, opposite leaves, inferior ovary, interpetular stipules, ruby, can't be anything else. Worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> See, and if you learn that, you get this little you get this little dichotomous key in your head, you know, and, and it's mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. I sure. agree. I agree. Yep. And I'm hooked. I'm personally hooked. <laughs> I know that. I know oh, that. No, it's always fun to be able to go out and botanize, no matter where you go. Oh, I agree. The flower, yeah, right? I, wanted, I wanted to show you a rare picture that I found of the uh, water lettuce and its flowers. Isn't that cool? Yeah, probably, probably goose pollinated, you know. <laughs> Those <laughs> flowers, no. gentlemen, are not, they're not no. like those pinheads that have the little balls on them. That's the size of that. Yeah, I mean, like, I I didn't even know where to look for these. And as soon as I was paying attention to this presentation, I was like, gosh, i got to uh, dig for some pictures and share them with our viewers. Well, That's really, really small. I was privileged really small. to have some classes with Dr. Arthur Cronquist the great evolutionary guy at the New York Botanical Garden. He said, if you're looking for flowers, look in the crotch of the stem. <laughs> but he, gotcha. you know, he always said weird things like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. Some of these are so hard to, uh, they're not showy at all. No, they're no. They're meant no. to be clandestine and they get the job done. <laughs> well, and then you have alligator flag. You have, not alligator flag, alligator plant. That's, yeah. uh, that's the Thalia geniculata. Anthurium, no, Anthurium mandrianum. That's, see, that's the trouble with common names. Anthurium, not with an H. Anthurium, T H U R E I M, right? Andrianum, A N D R E A. Yep, I got it. There it is. That is a weed in the Western Cordillera of Colombia. You walk on it all day. And that, that plant and Spathophyllum uh, willisii are the two plants that absorb more than 20 times their weight in volatile organics inside buildings. No way. Yes. No wonder they're indoor plants. Well, you you can really use them, and they for some reason they love anything that's a uh, aromatic compound. So you know, one of those. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Rings, Arabic. volatiles, yeah, and I mean they just polyuenes, etc. Yeah, you can tell if if you're in a building that has new carpeting that's been put down. You know, when mm -hmm. the the way they build them now, they glue it to the cement floor, right, and nothing else. I mean, the, you put them in there, and all of a sudden they're just like going crazy. Well, that they're purifying the air. <laughs> really, it's it's just bizarre. Right, yeah, very 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 cool. Good observation. Yeah. Um. I always like to tell people some practical stuff. So in, yeah. in our audience knows native plants, and even though those aren't native. Not native, but, you know, they, they have a purpose. And yeah, if they're indoors. For inside. You don't can't complain. Them. There you go. There you go. You can, if they're indoors, they can't do much harm. <laughs> yeah, if a person is restricted indoors and they're, and they're not feeling well, and you bring them a nice plant like that, it cleans the yeah. air where they are, and, and you've mm -hmm. done it on the surface, you know? Yes, absolutely. And and folks, if you're listening, I mean, having plants indoors really brings, there, there, there are so many um, benefits, not just cleaning the air, but also feeling like you have a personal connection with the outdoors. There are uh, cultural values, especially in Japanese culture and uh, some uh, Mesoamerican cultures where bringing plants indoors really uh, is part of the lifestyle and your tradition. Uh, uh, Dr. Papoli, I wanted to bring in some starch grains for you. Oh, yeah. Those are the coolest things. From um, Yeah. You yeah. want to touch on that and you want to describe yeah. these cool you, things for us? Yeah. Can you can you Google um, uh, from um, Canna 
C A N N A. Yeah. Arch grains, because those are the largest in the world. These are weird looking ones that you have here from uh, uh, mango ginger. I don't know what mango ginger is. It's got to be a, a ginger of family. Yeah. So where are the can of starch grains? What are these? Up up there. Up, up, you're going away. The blue with the blue background. Yeah. Turn off all ads, okay? Yeah. Oh, where'd it go? Yeah, it just kind of let's see. They escaped. There we go. Let's, yeah, let's see. Share. Or just click. Oh, visit. Click visit because maybe it'll show up. Yeah, All right, let's try that. Yeah, just want oh, to pull yeah. it out. Oh, because it wants to sell you the lessons. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Happens. It's but you part of uh, the greens there. It's the, too bad you can't make it make it bigger easily. Yeah. So I'm always trying to sell something. Of course. That's usual. Yeah, the starch greens are in there. They're pretty big. Yeah, so the, the cassava starch is there. The can of starch is right there in the bottom left. And then the mug bean starch. So it's, it's a good... Comparative uh, picture that or slide that somebody has put together. Well, no, they're all to scale. So look how much bigger these are. This is incredible. Yeah. And the yeah. thing, cassava is cassava is of zero nutritive value. The only people reason why people eat it is is when you when you eat a little cassava bread, it it, it inflates in your stomach. So if you're a poor person, you can only eat once a day. You don't feel oh. hungry the rest of the day. So it's actually no kind of sad. A lot of people get. Um, they get uh, malnutrition. Yeah, they, especially cassava brava, the one they have to grind up and then pull the milk the the milk out of and everything. You know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. At the Amazon. That's uh, all the way out to the Guianas, actually. Oh, so, yeah. Well, there's canna, and guys, our our native canna, canna flaccida, uh, yellow bandana of the Everglades. That's what the common name is. That is completely edible. From rhizome to leaf, so you leave, use leaves of the salad. You can throw the flowers as garnish. You can boil the starch rhizomes. You can eat that. I mean, it's uh, the completely edible plant. People find uh, value in that, especially when they're trying to associate uh, food security uh, in times like this with native plants. Um, the message associated with it, and I say that there are native plants that are edible, and here we are. Can of starch. The Toyota Foundation uh, donated uh, over half a million dollars to improve the size and and um, um, taste of of uh, rhizomes of canna for uh, Vietnam after the war. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, and they did. They come up with some cannas that are very pretty and have wonderful. Um, Easily digestible starch, and they make all kinds of really? and stuff with them. Yeah, and it's from the a gift from the Toyota Foundation to say, um, let let's um, uh, you you promise to recover ten thousand mines that are buried around, and we'll give you ten thousand dollars worth of research money for every. No way. Yeah, that's so. That's what they did. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Uh, so, folks, I want to. I want to actually touch on a few more things I, I, I pulled up with Dr. Pipoli's uh, presentation tonight. Here's the Fly River. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. It is so, just amazing. Yeah. Isn't that cool? So, you know, uh, it's actually located in Papua New Guinea. I, I can pull up a, a, a graph of that very quickly. But here's the Fly River in red. And look how green I mean, it looks completely green. This is indicative of a uh, relatively undisturbed rainforest. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Every yeah. time a botanist goes on an expedition on the Fly River, mm -hmm. more than 20 new, new spe species new to science are discovered daily. And That's amazing. For every 10 days, two new genera of flowering plants are discovered. Now, if you amazing. talk about insects and particularly beetles it's like mm -hmm. 50 new species a day it's just crazy if we could get uh, 
50,000 scientists to, to work with the Papua New Guineans and get them up to speed and go and do that. It would be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, outside of the island used to be called Erie and Jaya. It's property of Indonesia and it's now called Pap Papua Barat. B -R -B -A -R -A -T. Yeah. Just north of Australia, guys, in case yeah. you need to place things. It was a colony of Australia. And yeah. you know, Australia has a tough time managing itself, much less in other countries. <laughs> the problem there is just everything is a fortune. Yeah. Well, the number uh, one commodity that they export are um, are one gallon bottles of of stout that's eleven percent <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> I wonder why everybody's smashed all the time. <laughs> oh, and everybody chose beetle nut. That's pi Piper. Uh, it's um. um Piper Battelle, and it's um, what's mm -hmm. the name? Palm. Yes. The betel leaf palm. The, yes, the, the betel nut palm. And then mm -hmm. uh, you take the outside off and you start to chew it. And then you Very take addictive. a spike of Piper methysticum and put it in um, wow. lime and stick it in your mouth. And when you do, it re immediately releases this red juice that's, yes. that's like... Uh, Carcinogenic. Uh, of well, no, people tell me the only thing like it is pure cocaine. The, the people oh, get no. a rush. So if you imagine you're living in a country where it's close to 97 degrees Fahrenheit, morning, noon, and night, every day, all day. <laughs> only really wealthy expats that live there have air conditioning. Nobody else does. Yeah. The buses are air conditioned, nothing else. So people chew this thing to keep from falling asleep all the time. So, but the problem is there's signs on all the buses and all everywhere because people spit the red stuff out because it burns. <laughs> of it's, course it does. The sidewalk red, like red paint. So there's red paint everywhere. But even when the president talks, the prime minister talks on the television, his teeth are all red from chewing beetle wet. Oh, Interesting place. But they're so nice. I loved working with those guys. In so, Papua. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The only problem is there were a lot of people that were kind of violent, so. If you, yeah. if you, if you yeah. want to a restaurant, they come and get you in an armed car. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 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 Philo Texas. I, okay. I think you, I think you pronounce it Philo Texas. Well, no, no. Texas is P T Y X I S, and that is the arrange that that refers to the position of the margins to the midrib and to each other. There it is. Texas definition and meaning. There you go. Down here. Gotcha. Yeah, this is circinate vernation. So what this is, is that thing is wrapped over on itself and then wrapped again. So it's doubly wrapped. And see, the, ah. the, see here's the midrib and here's the way this uh, this one margin Darn. comes, in, and then another margin comes. This is supervolute Texas. Here, looking down below, morphology of flowering plants, lecture eleven, mm -hmm. philotaxy and Texas tells you the difference. That's cool. I didn't know there was a lecture on that. Yeah, I'll have to go check that out. Yeah, on medical and world. Yeah. Oh, excavation. That's the other one, but for, but for flowering plants. Mm -hmm. For, mm -hmm. for the, the floral parts. So quincuncial. Yep. Quincuncial. I'm going to analyze A for you. It's quincuncial because there are five parts. Oh, can you come down just a little bit? No. Yep. Yeah, go up. Up, 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 up. To see the diagram. I'm going to explain it to people. Oh, yeah. So A. Yes, A. Here's the deal. The way you look, you have to understand what you're looking at. What in, what's important are margins. So with King Quincuncio, you have two whose margins are out. You have two whose margins are in, and one that's in and out. That's Quincuncio. Oh, I get it, guys. So each other. yeah. So here's. Here's one that's out. Here's another that's out. Here's one that's in. Here's another one that's in. And there's the fifth one that's in and out. 
And see, that's yeah. a special type of um, of uh, what is it? Imbricate. Now, if they all overlap by just one, so they have mm -hmm. in, out, in, out, in, out, that's that's contorted. Okay, that would be the touch this one. D. D is contorted. Contorted. You're right. Yes. And e, and e is valvate because each margin touches each other margin. Yes. And imbricate. Uh I don't know about imbricate. I think B is imbricate, isn't it? No, it's twisted. Oh, okay. Well, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> this should be imbricate, I think. See, but anyway, that's people. People that are trying to figure stuff out when they describe like a new genus and it has a strange flower, they'll cut the flower in half, transverse wise, and then they'll look at how the petals are in bud. Then they'll move out, pull it and then they'll do this with the sepal so people know. Yeah. C is C is classified as cochleate. Oh cochleate. Well it's because it's a spiral. Yeah. But cochleate's really a type of uh, imbricate. So is I a. would assume is I would assume as much, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that I mean I I find it so fascinating because I mean you know, the devil is in the details. Right, it right. It really is. You have to look. You have to truly, truly look at some very basal features in order to figure out what clade it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, the <laughs> other thing, for those of you who are historians, the the person that really refined um, our our science of describing floral parts and organs was John Lindley, an orchid guy. He's the one that figures out that is that a yeah L I N D L E Y. L E Y, yeah. He he was a big orchid guy and um he was the first one to realize that as an orchid flower matures it spins around 180 degrees. If you look, all orchid ovaries are twisted. They are called resupinates. And that was one of Lindley's big contributions. He actually had a dictionary of terms for flowering plants that he convinced all the Brits and everybody in Europe to accept. And then there was a woman that studied ferns at the California Academy in 1935. She mm -hmm. up it because two of his drawings were wrong. And she, <laughs> she's the only person nerdy enough to have caught that. <laughs> well, goes to show you that some people are truly, truly nerdy. invested in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, that's their life. Life is a gift and we're happy. Let me tell you. <laughs> two, two wrongs and you're out. <laughs> Well, uh, Dr. Bipoli, it's been a real treat. And folks, we will see you again. Our final rendition of this four-part series is next week. Same time, same place. Monday, August yeah, it's 22nd. It's going to be a very brief talk. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not even a tenth of the dicots I'm going to cover. But what I'm going to go in, in detail and remind me to send you, I wrote my own key to the new... Um, six subfamilies of of legumes we've mm -hmm. gone from six subfamilies but they are so logical and a lot of it's based on development so the next time you see a red bud you'll see that the calyx is closed in bud whoever noticed that before and as it opens it pairs irregularly and guess what <laughs> oh, many a hong kong orchid tree the flower does the same thing that's why the sepals always look so weird. And people had trouble keying it out. But we finally well, realized that after the DNA sequenced and they said, God, this is these are in the same group. How the hell is that? They don't look anything alike. And then people say, hey, let's look at the flower buds and watch flower yeah. 
they get old. Oh my God, look, they're doing the same thing. Oh, the same has developed the same way. Oh, this is too weird. <laughs> that's that's what happened. And there are enough legume people in the world. There are some folks that are paid to do nothing but watch how legume flowers open. What a fun job that is. <laughs> well, no, agriculture, they found out that half of the cultivated legumes in the world that are our crops that we eat, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if the if the pollen is not taken from the anther within so many days, the ovary grows the ovules into seeds. So they so they're they 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 self they're selfing, yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Amazing. Yeah. A lot of the peas do that and a lot of the other the um, the pigeon peas do that too. And and a number of the phaseolus and vigna do that. And you know, these things feed half the world, more than half the world, three quarters of the world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's it's kind yeah. of a testament to uh artificial selection, if I may say so. Yeah, 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 sure. Absolutely. Yeah. This is this yeah. is millennia worth of hard working people, our ancestors, that really were so keen to make sure that they could produce the best product and well, stay competitive in an almost ever changing agricultural landscape. Very slowly the, but definite. There are three there are three crops that the Incas, the Mayans, and the Aztecs share. Chocolate uh and then the legumes and then things akin to rice corn didn't go all the way down in the beginning but mm -hmm. remember remember the the most valuable corn germ plasm is it is in manatlan in mexico it's the zia diploperennis it's the perennial corn that doesn't wow. die. and it its introduction and the U.S. paid Mexico for some of the germplasm, then sent the developed seeds back to them. This, really? Yeah, this isn't uh, genetically modified. This is just crossing with it and everything else. Right, right, right. Yeah. They eliminated six kinds of the major corn rusts immediately. Wow. But see, nobody ever talks about that. Nobody. It's two little scientists in um, Guadalajara working with the big shots at the University of Colorado and at Michigan yeah. State and Cornell, those three universities. And the and they're working a day and night and their students are slaving away. And what are we going to do? And how can we do this? And which way should this cross be? And let's mark it all out. And the old fashioned way, this is when I was uh, uh, be, uh, finishing my undergraduate career in uh, between 73 and 75, 78. Mm -hmm. That's when all that stuff was going on. And then you, Elton, oh University of Wisconsin, is w figured out how corn got to be the way it is. Uh, oh my gosh, like, uh, folks! I mean, like the gravity of what? Oh yeah, was just said. I, I think it's going to be the most underrated thing of this century. Absolutely, Co corn rust can not only cause billions of dollars in profit loss, but can substantially affect not just food security but politics world politics of course for decades to come ethanol oh my god and yeah biofuels yeah crazy yeah. crazy all Folks, that good whiskey and everything three states would go broke <laughs> <laughs> I'd be frustrated. No Jack Daniels rye. No Jack Daniels bourbon. Oh my god! Really? Uh, uh, <laughs> just to show you how global and how important uh, the world community is, the world of botanists and yeah. the quiet work that they do in all their small little labs and oh, yeah. learning areas and universities and educational institutions, no matter how big or small they are. We really ought to celebrate and acknowledge and uplift people like you, uh, Dr. Pipoli. Oh, thank you. I know. You, I, I can't st stress this enough. You know, you are highly underrated on my book, and it's a it's a true privilege to have you on these live streams. Oh, thank God. Wow, nobody has said that to me before. I really appreciate it. I really do. Thank uh, you. So, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, folks, 
we will conclude this. Uh, PJ Espinal, as usual, your acolyte always uh, sends you much love and gratitude. Thank you so, Thank you so much. much. So interesting, helpful. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes. And, for being there. Yes, and uh, we we really had a good treat. Uh, see you guys next Monday, uh, same time, same oh, place, yeah, and we will conclude the four part series. Get all your friends. Tell them we're going to count our beans the right way. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, guys. Thanks right, so much. Take care.